On the one hand, we had this incredibly popular and rigorous and interesting curriculum and wonderful students who were winning prizes and doing all kinds of things, and yet we didn't actually fit anywhere in the university. It's what I write in the 30th anniversary, that it was like a, a, a nice little plant growing between the cracks in the academia world. So a lot of my time was actually spent educating yet another assistant dean about what the program was, bringing them over, introducing the students, and trying to protect our budget because they would see this large amount of money. And yet when you calculated it, it was a much lower cost per student than almost any other place on the university's campus. And so there was that aspect of it, which was the, the struggle with the administration and feeling that you had to be in lots of places at once to make sure someone else wasn't taking your money or your, or your space. But secondly, the, the, the positive side was that every time you'd go to the program and you'd talk to the students or you'd have your office hours or you'd discuss an honors project with a student, you'd realize these are abundantly talented kids who are so motivated and so interesting and also so able that it, it just made up for the kind of hassle that comes with the territory of being the director. And this has changed actually in the last couple of years because an outside person came in and that changed really the way people look at and think about the program and just say it's successful not because it's easy or because it's got a funny name but because it actually is really helping students guide their lives so that their academic work is also really directly related to their personal views of things. As the director then I was thinking about what kinds of things that I would like to see change. And the university was beginning to recognize that one of the things that, that Stanford could offer that others couldn't was a real support for research. So there, there were here and there support for honors theses and so forth, but they raised a lot of money. And among those were ways in which undergraduates beginning as sophomores could actually begin to do research. And so I went to the vice provost and said, what if you gave us a block grant and we administered it? because human biology doesn't have uh, assigned faculty except for a handful, and we can't accept all these students, but we'd like to encourage them to do any number of a range of things. We'd like to vet that internally, and that led to what's now called the HB Rex program, which later on was, was really improved greatly by my wife when she took, over it, it took it over it some years later. But basically, it really brought research further down the ladder to sophomores after their sophomore year. You know, when you become an academic at a research institution, there's a lot of emphasis on your research, rightly so. That's what sort of keeps the world working the way it does. But in human biology, we've been allowed to combine that with our teaching in a way that really lets us bring into the classroom things that we care deeply about. So for a period of three years, my wife, who's a developmental psychologist, and I taught together in the core and had a and B sides almost completely overlapping, and it was really a very intense and wonderful time, but it was mostly educating ourselves about how much interaction there could be between these two kinds of views of the world. And that really shaped a lot of my subsequent research, which has been really about how social information gets into the brain and how that social information changes the nervous system in fundamental ways. So it's, it's really the opposite of how most people think about the brain controlling behavior. In fact, behavior does a lot to shape your brain. So we think of the brain as sort of being delivered to us in utero and you grow up and you have a brain, but you're building the brain. It's a specialized brain for your life. If you become a tennis star or a chess player or anything else, it'll leave a mark in your brain. And no one really knows how this social information, this learning information is stored and changes the structures of the brain. So we have a model system in which animals change from being territorially dominant and non-dominant. The dominant animals have actually a suite of cells we've discovered that change size when you become dominant, they become larger, they become connected, and they regulate the reproductive behavior. Part of the reason that I think I've become so really committed to having undergraduates in the lab is that they can very quickly get into this model system and really understand a lot about it. And why is that? Well, these fish, in a very transparent way, are interested mostly in, in food and sex. And this is just like the undergraduate experience. So I've had 
65 honor students and about 40 have gone into academic work. The rest have gone into medical or MD, PhD programs. And some of them have been really dramatic. So one young woman was really committed to neurobiology and came and worked in the lab and really didn't suit her. And so she said, well, I'm going to go back to ballet. And she then went on to be a ballerina in New York City after this. So I consider that as much a success as not because she did an experiment on herself and said, nope, it's not for me. The others, many have done really interesting things that are, are kind of outside the box. So Kieran Soma, who was the first undergraduate I had, had, as we all do, parents with different ambitions than he had. And although he became really enchanted with neurobiology, there was resistance to him following this because of for cultural and personal reasons. So he decided he would go and teach school in Ecuador for a year, which he did. He taught at a private school in Ecuador. And during this time, became more convinced that he wanted to go into neuroscience. So he came back and worked in my lab for another year, published two really influential papers, and then went on to do a postdoctoral, I mean, a graduate work at University of Washington and postdoctoral work at UCLA, and now is a faculty member at the University of British Columbia. And I see him quite often at neuroscience meetings. And many of the students who uh, have worked in the lab will stay in touch with us and send us pieces of information or read about us in the press and then say, oh, I saw this happen. And that's really a real thrill to have some one of your former students say, wow, I just saw you in the New York Times or something like that. So We developed a program called um, Beyond Human Biology in which we bring back graduates to help the undergraduates see that they can follow a different path. One of the most telling ones was a, um, a management consultant. And he said that he used in his work most commonly the, all the information he learned from ecology and that the ecological webs they learned about were just like the businesses he was trying to help. And he recalled turning to his notes even from the 2A, 2B course to figure out how to help some company survive. And I realized that this is the kind of information that the students take much more to heart because here's a person who's actually earning a living and was a human biology major and didn't really f uh, center his work in ecology and evolution. He actually went on to do some kind of management science mixed degree, but that it was more valuable. The core itself was more valuable. One student was a woman um, of Japanese origin whose area of concentration was really studying the sociobiology of the internment camps. And she won a grant to go and look for something that her relatives had told her, which was that the US government actually knew about tuberculosis in the internment camps, but had kept it quiet. And they required other members of the family to come take care of the people who had TB. And in that way, they actually caused the, the, the whole crisis in tuberculosis to spread in the internment camp. And she was in Washington, D.C., and I got a call from her that she had gotten in, inappropriately access to a, an archive where she found records showing that what she had heard from her relatives was true and wrote this wonderful honors thesis in which she unveiled the duplicity of the U.S. government in treating these Japanese citizens in these really egregious ways. And, and she then turned that into a book and went on to medical school and has, has really been a wonderful example of how she could take a personal issue, which really you wouldn't think of as having an academic basis, and carry it through with real scholarship and discovery to um, a real tribute to her family as well as an intellectual exercise. And that really st struck me as one of the most wonderful things about the program. Actually, in the end of the the book we put together for the 30th anniversary, I talk about the future and the kinds of questions we're going to face, which we're already on the threshold of facing. We will have cyber warfare in addition to ordinary warfare. We will have all kinds of issues that we see coming, which is global warming, um, you know, political destruction of various countries, and, and how are we going to deal with those? And I think students who have a, a firm grip of themselves and their role in the world will have a higher probability of being able to solve those problems or at least understand the problems. And once you've defined the problem and understood it, its dimensions, you have a higher probability of being able to figure out what to do about it. And whether 
whether this comes because they learn enough to do this or as you imply maybe they are actually more internally reflective so they actually can see themselves acting in the world and wondering how their role can be maximized. So I've had students come to me and say, will I have more impact on the world as an individual physician or a public health worker or in policy or in politics? How can I choose amongst these? And these are students who have the talent to do any of these. And they're wondering where can they maximize their impact so that they aren't just another cog in the wheel. And I think once you have students thinking like that, you have a higher probability of getting real change in the world from people who are going to be able to do that. So I think that's the answer that they're, we're trying to give them the toolkit to figure out how to become better citizens and choose wisely amongst their options. Perfect. Okay.